I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Uh, you've heard this cliche many, many times. The wheels of justice turn very slowly. And when you are talking about a murder case and you're talking about the family members of the victim, when those words are spoken, it is extra painful for those wheels of justice turning slowly through the investigation and into the prosecution of the person allegedly responsible for the murder of your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your cousin, whoever it is. It is torturous. You've seen it firsthand here on Court TV. Just recently in the popcorn movie Murder Trial, Nicole Olson. Nicole Olson was wearing this on her shoulders for years. She waited eight years before that trial started. Curtis Reeves, the man who shot and killed her husband, was able to litigate his way into an incredible delay. And that took a toll on her. I spoke to her before the trial, a year before the trial. And it was still part of her life, day in and day out, waiting for a chance for justice because that's all was left. Her husband was never coming back. The father of their child was never coming back. He was dead. She was holding on to the hope for justice. We know how that turned out. It was awful for her. Awful. Incredibly painful. But the waiting, the waiting is the salt in the wound for these family members. I want to tell you about another family member tonight. The mother of a murder victim. She's been waiting 12 years. 12 years since her son was murdered, waiting through years of investigation, trying to figure out who was responsible. And then from that point, waiting for the trial. It took 12 years. Could you imagine? You know, we often say it's unimaginable the pain that these families suffer. I don't necessarily agree with that. I've spoken to enough of them, and I think you've heard enough of the family members through the years, that it is imaginable the torture that they go through, waiting for that day to come. Well, that day happened today for Deborah Marion. She was able to testify in day one of the trial for the murder of her son, Lorenzen Wright, former NBA star. This is a guy who lived an in incredible life, incredible talent. I'm so jealous. Living the dream in the NBA, had like a 13-year career. That's a long career in professional sports. Long career. And his mom loved him like every mom loves their child. Most. Almost all. We come across too many here that don't, right? But the way a mother loves a son and loves a child. And that was taken from her. He's never coming back. And now 12 years later, finally, she gets a day in court. And this is her moment. And, and I can't understate to you how important this moment is for her and other family members in similar situations. As I said, Lorenzen's not coming back. And that's a tough fact to deal with. So what is she holding on to? A sense of someone will be held responsible and the people who are responsible will pay the price and the truth will come out. In the trial, the truth will come out. That's what they want the most, is the truth. And that's what trials are supposed to be. Today was day one. Billy Ray Turner on trial for the murder of Lorenzen White. The allegation is he had some help as well. Today, opening statements. I want to play you something first, before we get to those opening statements, for you to really understand the pain that this woman has gone through, this mother. I wanna show you something that happened in 2017. So this is going back. She had to wait another five years after this. But how painful it was for her and how emotional it was for her to be in the courtroom with the man accused of the murder of her son. Take a look. You have any questions, sir? No. Uh, Mr. Turner, you may step back to the back. Ms. Williams, we'll come talk How to could you have murdered my son? Uh, okay. That's what yeah. I did. You know, just how? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Mr. Craig, I understand your pain. I understand the ordeal you've gone through for the last seven years. Uh, what brought me back to Memphis, Ms. Wright, because I was trying to kill my father. So I understand what you're going through. But I cannot allow you, Ms. Wright, or anyone else to react that way in the court. Well, I'm ready to go in the way I can go out the same. Yes, ma'am. And you're welcome to be back to court next Tuesday on the 12th of December. But you cannot disrupt the courtroom, Ms. Wright. I'm not going to disrupt. I told him what I want him to know. This is something that we've been going on for a long time. This case is not going to be resolved anytime soon. I've been for seven long years for you, almost seven and a half years. But I'm going to ask you to pay. Uh, allow Mr. Hagerman, who's representing the state of the case, to do his job. Uh, allow this case to run through its normal course of business through the criminal justice system. I want to offer you and your family my personal condolences for your loss. But you're not doing a member of your son good. And you're not helping your son. You're not helping um, the administration of justice by engaging in that sort of an outburst. That was five years ago. Five, she had, I mean, she waited seven years for that moment and now has had to wait another five years to get to trial. But it happened today. Let me take you inside the courtroom for the opening statements. Cheryl Wright's not a professional killer. This is not something she does. She doesn't have a phone directory of hitmen. No. She had to reach out to people that she trusted or that were indebted to her or that, what did we talk about yesterday? Sketchy uncle, maybe with some criminal past. She had to reach out to people like that to get this thing planned, done, and covered up. Two people in particular. And the first, who I am talking about now, is Billy Turner. Billy Turner was Shara Wright's friend. Billy Turner was Shara Wright's yard man. Turn with Cheryl Wright's romantic secret interest. Billy Turner was somebody that Cheryl Wright could trust, manipulate, and use. Listen to what a person who a few days after he was convicted of killing his girlfriend, goes in and tells detectives that I can solve this. And then you're gonna also have to listen to the fact that as he's telling his story, they buy it hook, line, and sinker, and they write him a contract, and they do all of this stuff before they pull Facebook records. Between Cheryl and Jimmy, and be clear on this, because I don't want it to come out that I'm confusing anybody or anything. Before you get concentrated Facebook messages between Shara and Jimmy, and you see those messages, and you can take a third grader and figure what they're talking about, and guess whose name ain't no damn where near it? Yeah. Billy's got his own life that he's living. Billy would loan his car to any of y'all if somebody that he knew vouched for you. He don't know nothing about little Jimmy other than Jimmy comes to the house one day while he's over there and Shara's talking about Jimmy needs a car. He doesn't have a car, but he has these DJ gigs. And you'll see Billy demanding his car back because it took a little long. That's all. But more importantly, you'll hear the people that will come in and talk about what Billy was doing to a person that evening. What he was doing, when I say to a person, I mean three or four witnesses that will tell you that on the evening of July 18, 2010, Billy was here. Billy was doing X, Y, Z. Billy did this during the evening. You'll see pictures of Billy during that evening. That's God's grace. <laughs> because ain't nobody sitting up trying to plan an alibi. Here's my concern after opening statements. 
Uh, number one, not an easy case for prosecutors. And I just hope that Deborah Marion, Lorenzen's mom, has been prepared uh, for a very unpredictable outcome here because anything can happen. We see it uh, time after time here on Court TV. So I just hope emotionally um, she's ready to take this journey uh, through this trial because uh, you never know what the outcome is going to be. Uh, let me bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Payne, who's joining us live tonight from Memphis, Tennessee. Chanley, great to see you. Um, interesting opening statements. Looks like we have two completely different stories. It looks like the defense is pointing the finger in the obvious places, the ex-wife and the star witness slash convicted murderer in another case. Um, but I understand there was a 911 call that was played today in court. What can you tell us about that? You know, Vinny, we cover trials all over the country. We hear a lot of 911 calls. This one is different, and it made a resounding effect inside the courtroom. It was played during opening statements. It was played again during the detective's testimony this afternoon. The final words of the victim himself, Lorenzen Wright, before a barrage of gunfire. It's a powerful moment. The family reacted. Let's watch. <laughs> Georgia 911, where's your emergency? Hello? 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 Two male voices. The first male voice is the caller, Laura's right. The second male voice is the killer. And then you'll hear gunshot after gunshot after gunshot. Describe generally what we hear on that call. You hear uh, Lorenzen. Uh, kind of say, oh, and you hear some gunshots, and then you hear somebody say something. It, it's in, been interpreted different by the different people that listen to it, but it almost sounds like, to me, get them, and then more gunshots, and then the phone. Hangs. A male voice? Correct. Lorenzo's voice, a male voice, and then whatever said, like you said, it's just hard to make it out. Correct. Another male voice. It sounds like another male voice. Right. And Vinny, this 911 call, so important to this case and really compounding the tragedy of this case, that was a call placed at 1212 a.m. July 19th, 2010. The dispatcher didn't do anything. The authorities didn't respond to this barrage of gunfire. The prosecution wanting to make clear that because of that delay, they didn't discover this call until about nine days later that Lorenzen had placed this on his cell phone, the last call that he made, that in that time, the co-conspirators were allegedly able to clean up the scene, go back and cut the barbed wire to get rid of evidence, to find one of the murder weapons. And so that was a that was big and revealing in the opening and of course in the evidence today as the jury was taken back to the crime scene. But I have to mention, every time this 911 call was played, the family in the gallery of Lorenzen Wright uh, reacted emotionally. In fact, the mother, uh, Deborah Marion, ran out of the courtroom this afternoon in a very noticeable way. The judge even took a pause uh, before playing this 911 call, and the jury noticed as well. It's just high emotions inside this courtroom, and again, have been building up for nearly 12 years, Vinny, and I, I want to bring up one more revelation this afternoon with the detective on the stand, the prosecution trying to establish this communication between Shira Wright and Billy Ray Turner with newly revealed text messages and communications between the two. So before that 911 call, in fact, 25 minutes before this 911 call is placed by Lorenzen Wright, we have Shira Wright texting Billy Ray Turner uh, in those moments uh, saying, I'm going to need my commission. I may want you to bring your business cards in the a.m. before you fly out. You owe me, boy. So again, piece by piece, it's only day one, Vinny, but this prosecution building a case against Billy Ray Turner. 12 years in the making. Um, 
I understand you had an opportunity to speak with Lorenzen's mom, Deborah. What, what did she have to say? Clearly so affected still by the loss of her son, Lorenzen. She had some tears in her eyes as she explained to me what she missed most about him, his vibrant smile of all of her children. He was the one with the perfect teeth, she said. What a character she is, uh, Vinny. And I asked her, of course, about what she thought of the prosecution's evidence against Shira, against Billy Ray Turner. She believes, even though Shira Wright, her former daughter-in-law, pled guilty to facilitation of murder. She played a more direct role. Let's listen. Do you think Shira was one of the ones with the handgun that shot Lorenzen too? Yes, the bullet in his face. I'll say that till the day I die. To the day I die, his face shot was hers. Vinny, we learned today more than one different type of caliber handgun used in this case found at the crime scene. So again, she believes that Shira actually wielded one of those handguns and shot Lorenzen in the face. She will always believe that. She hopes, though, that Billy Ray Turner, who had been, in her view, manipulated by Shira Wright, spends the rest of his life behind bars because she herself is doing a life sentence without her son, Lorenzen. I must mention also in the gallery, her daughter, her, her youngest son there, who also plays basketball in college, they were in the courtroom without her. She, she left before graphic crime scene photos. I spoke with her uh, daughter and Lorenzen's sister and brother. They said that was the toughest part of the day, Vinny, because they never seen any of those crime scene photos, and so they really left uh, disheartened. Oh, all right. Chanley Painter, great reporting tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the trial continues tomorrow. Thank you, Chanley. Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining me in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor, law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling, in Palm Springs, California, trial attorney, Ann Bremner, and in West Palm Beach, Florida, former police lieutenant and trial attorney, Rick King. Great to see everyone tonight. Um, Michael Sterling, former uh, prosecutor, I am so concerned about Lorenzen's mom. Um, I don't, I, it, she has her family around her. I think that's great. I just hope that everyone is prepared for a very unpredictable ending. We don't know how these things end. Not only an unpredictable ending, Benny, but an unpredictable trial, right? You never know what's going to come out, the things that are going to be said, the things that you're going to see. You know, I tried a murder case at the uh, right before Christmas at the end of last year, uh, and things came out that just were completely unexpected. They had to call about 10, you know, DeKalb County police uh, security guards in uh, when the verdict was read because people were so concerned for both the safety of myself and the safety of the defendant. Uh, but you, you, you just never know how these things are going to end. And, you know, lawyers are doing their job, right? Prosecutors and defense attorneys are just trying to do their job. Uh, they're not involved in the criminal aspect of the case, but a lot of times people subscribe to defense attorneys, their clients' actions. Uh, and so, uh, you know, my hope is that they understand and the judge has explained to them the administration of justice to make sure that you preserve the record and that they understand that, you know, you're not doing anybody you're not doing anybody any 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 good uh, if, if you're going to have those type of outbursts. All right, we're, we're running a little long here in our first segment, um, but I, I think we had to. Um, so, Ann Bremner, Rick King, stand by. When